Writing tests is hard and boring and no one likes doing it. Yes, it's important. Yes, we need to do it. But it takes time away from the fun part of development and who wants to do that? Let's look at some ways we can create automated tests more quickly, including using Gen AI, of course. These tips are not only about writing code faster, but also ways to approach the problem of testing that reduces your mental load. Hello, I'm Trisha G. Welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. Here we like to talk about best practices, but we also like to give tips on how to apply these practices in the day job. If you like the idea of this, please subscribe. If this video gives you anything useful, please hit the like button. I asked developers on social media what slows down their automated tests, and I totally expected them to say, it takes too long to run my tests. In fact, the number one thing that slows down a developer when it comes to automated tests is writing them in the first place. Fortunately, I have a bunch of tips on how to write tests faster, so let me show you. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use our IDE to generate code for us. It shouldn't matter which IDE you're using because a bunch of them have similar types of functionality. In this case, I have a class open that doesn't have an existing test. So I'm going to, I can use navigate to test, which actually allows me to create a new test. I'm just going to take all the defaults, create a new test. And then I'm going to, there's a few different ways I can create a new test, but I can say generate me a test method, which will give me the bare minimum to get going. But I did say we were going to be writing tests faster, so I might need more than just the bare minimum. So what I've got is I use live templates because my tests, I always want them to look a particular way. So my live template always generates me a JUnit 5 unit test with this particular structure. So I might say something like should extract, extract username from a tweet. Some of this data might be a little bit old. And then it will generate the method name and the display name the way I want it. In this test that I want to write, I don't need this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my user service, get the Twitter handle from the tweet. I need to give it the text. So let's say example input. And then I'm going to paste in my input, which was on my clipboard. I also like to fold these things away. And then I'm going to put that in a variable. This is the Twitter handle. And do my assertion. Assert equals, um, the, my expected one is it's going to be my name. And then let's run this test. Which passes, hopefully for the right reason. We want to make sure our tests are passing for the right reason, otherwise we're not getting any value from our tests. So that's using your IDE to generate some of the boilerplate. As you learn to use your tools, you will be able to generate tests faster, write code faster. We've already covered this on videos in this channel before. What people are really interested in these days is, is AI going to speed me up here? So let's take a look at AI. We're going to look at a different example here. I've got a method here which isn't covered by tests, I can tell because it's gray. And this class does have a unit test. So let's ask, JetBrains AI Assistant to generate me a test for this method. Doesn't have to be JetBrains AI Assistant, it can be whichever assistant you're using. Okay, so for the method we're trying to test, it's generated me four different test methods. Single mood, multiple moods, empty strings, mixed case. Okay, so we can accept that. We might want to iterate over this too. 
let's use the IDE to fix up any problems. And one of the things we can do with some of these tools is we can say something like, we can ask it to make some changes. So uh, please add a test for map message to moods CSV with a single sad mood. And then it adds me a new test. Let's commit those changes. And we can even iterate over the everything in the test class. For example, we can say, please change all these tests to use par parameterized tests where possible. So it's done that. So you definitely can use AI not only to generate new tests, new test classes, new test cases, you can also use it to improve your tests if you want to. Of course, with anything, there are some benefits and downsides to using a tool like AI. Hopefully you've seen that AI is pretty good for generating mundane or predictable code. I mean, I say pretty good, but the IDE is even better at generating predictable code because boilerplate code will always look the same and the IDE will always generate it the same way. However, AI is pretty good at generating fairly predictable looking code for things like tests. AI is also good for generating things like test data. It can do things like generate you a whole bunch of users which match a particular pattern. It remembers, if you ask it to, to do things like the zero, one, many cases. It can generate test data with nulls where you wouldn't think about having nulls. So it's a pretty good assistant at doing these somewhat boring tasks. AI can also consider edge cases we haven't thought of. My experience of using AI to generate unit tests somewhat varies here because it's not deterministic. Sometimes it comes up with some really good edge cases and sometimes it does the opposite and it only comes up with a happy path. Using it to spark some inspiration on the test paths we haven't thought of is a good way of getting better test coverage with less thinking time. One of the major downsides from my point of view about using AI to generate tests is that it can only test what's there. It can test that the code does what it does. It does not test that the code is behaving the way it should behave. It doesn't know what the business wanted the code to do. This might be good for generating test cases for legacy code or code that's been stable for a while and it does what we want it to do. But it's not always great for generating tests for new code when what we really want to do is consider what did the business want this code to do? How should it behave? Should it do these things? And what should it do under these certain circumstances? That requires us to think about the actual expected behavior, not the actual behavior of the code itself. So AI is a decent companion when it comes to writing tests, but it certainly doesn't replace you when it comes to writing tests and code. Because it's not the writing of the code that was ever the problem when it comes to writing production code or test code. The thing that slows us down has always been and will always be the thinking about the code. As Dave Farley says, the keyboard is not the bottleneck. When there are two pair programmers side by side working together at a single keyboard, that keyboard is not the bottleneck to writing more code. The thing that slows us down when we're writing code is all the thinking that's involved. The thing that determines how fast we create tests is not how fast can I type something into the IDE. The thing that's slowing us down is, have I thought of all the edge cases? Have I really considered what the behavior of this code is supposed to be? Are there things it's doing that it shouldn't be doing and things it's not doing that it should be doing? Those are the things we need to capture in our test cases, whether they're unit tests or acceptance tests or performance tests. It requires us to think about what's going on and it's the thinking that slows us down. I do have some tips that will help us when it comes to the thinking about your tests. I'll tell you about them after I tell you about our sponsors. 
This video's sponsors are Equal Experts and Transfic. Equal Experts is a consultancy that's built on applying the ideas that we talk about here to build great software. Transfic is a financial technology company that applies advanced CI techniques to delivering low latency routing technology. These are exactly the kinds of tools and services we talk about on this channel. Take a look in the links in the description below. My number one tip for speeding up the thinking around writing tests is to bring a friend. It's always better to do something together, especially if it's something we don't want to do. This is something that's backed up by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. They say in their book, Agile Testing Condensed, we recommend that the developers who are good at writing efficient, maintainable code work together with the testers who are good at specifying test cases to automate tests. This way, both people in this partnership get to play to their strengths. The testers get to think about all the ways they could break your code and all the dumb things a user is going to do with the app. And then you get to write that down in an executable specification, otherwise known as a test, and write the application code so that these terrible things never happen. This is fun. We like writing code. And if the testers can help with the heavy lifting of the thinking about the tests, we can do the fun stuff of the writing of the test code. Working together makes this easier and leads to better quality tests. There's a quote from the poet Dorothy Parker. Creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. We need the creativity of thinking about new stuff that we could be doing, all the ways we could solve these problems. But we need the disciplined eye, for example, the automated tests, to tell us we're doing the right thing and we're taking it in the right direction and we haven't broken anything critical. Now, if you've taken the time to write decent tests, it takes a lot less time to troubleshoot a failing test. I spent a lot of time looking at how we troubleshoot failures, particularly tests failing in CI, where we might not know the context of that failure. The number one piece of advice that I have for someone trying to troubleshoot a failing test is to hope that the person who wrote that test gave it a sensible name and made failures descriptive. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to troubleshoot. This example shows two patterns I really hate when it comes to automated tests. If you've got a test method name like test increment, which tells you nothing about what it's testing. Is it testing that it does increment? Is it testing what happens when it fails to increment? How much should it increment by? Why should it increment and under which circumstances? And then the other thing it does is uses assert true, which is my least favorite assertion. It uses assert true with no message. So when it fails, it says, ah, oh, I sort of thought it was gonna be true, but it was false. And you, as the troubleshooting developer, go, well, okay, but why did you think it was going to be true and why is it false? And you have no information about that. When you're writing a test, you need to think about the poor person troubleshooting it if it goes wrong, because that poor person is likely to be you. Tests actually have the most value when they fail. They don't really give you much value if they're passing all the time, other than to tell you everything's fine. Where the value really comes in is when they fail. So your test name needs to tell you what is expected and why, so that you understand what to do when it fails. It gives you the most valuable information when it fails. So if we invest a little bit of time in writing tests which are more descriptive, it will save us a lot more time when it comes to troubleshooting those failures. For example, we could have tests which tell us exactly what the expected behavior is. And we can use descriptive assertions which will show us what was expected and what actually happened. And that should point us in the right direction for troubleshooting that test if it fails. I also like to see given, when, and then, as you saw in my example. This is a pattern I got used to when I was using Spock as a testing framework. I really like given, when, and then. It forces me to think about what is the setup of this test? What is the thing I'm actually testing? And what assertions am I making? This encourages us to write tests which are testing one single thing. And when that test fails, we can tell based on where in the method it failed, what could have gone wrong. Is it setup? Is it expectations? 
or is it the actual thing being tested? So investing a small amount of time in writing more descriptive tests will save us a lot more time in the long run. Finally, I want to talk about writing better tests. Writing tests should be exactly the same as writing production code. That code might not be used by the end user, but it's a really important part of making sure that the code that is used by the end user is high quality and does what the user expects. This means we should be applying exactly the same principles to our test code as we are to our production code. For example, separation of concerns, encapsulation, solid, high cohesion, loose coupling, fast performance, and so on. All the things that Dave Farley talks about a lot on this channel, and he talks about a lot in his book Modern Software Engineering. There is a tension between these different things. For example, if you have much better separation between your tests, you might have worse performance, because each individual test might have more expensive setup and teardown. You need to understand the tension between those different ideals so that you can make those design decisions. Again, a shameless promotion for a book that I didn't write and I get no money for. Read Dave Farley's Modern Software Engineering book because this will really help you to make some of those decisions. So, to sum up what we've talked about. To write tests faster, of course you want to embrace automation. Of course you want to embrace tooling. These things can really help you, whether it's learning how to use your IDE, a topic that I really do care about, or whether it's learning how to use AI to complement your test writing skills. These tools can help you write tests faster, but there's something much more important than that. There is a time investment in writing tests because there should be thinking involved. It's the thinking about what the code should do, what the expected behavior is, that takes the time. However, you do have to do that thinking, whether you do it when you write the production code or when you write the test code. So it doesn't really matter when you spend that time thinking. I would argue it makes much more sense to spend the time thinking about it when you're writing the test code so you can write down all those thoughts and all those trade-offs that you're making in a set of executable specifications which get run all the time in your continuous delivery pipeline, your tests. And finally, it is worth investing time in writing better tests. They'll be easier to troubleshoot, less flaky, and they will better document your system's expected behavior. Yes, it takes a while to write automated tests. Yes, it takes longer to write good automated tests. But it is worth it. The investment does pay off. I urge you to try it out for yourself and see the payoff for yourself. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to our loyal patrons who support this channel and get extras from being part of our Patreon community. If you're interested in being one of these lucky folks, check out the links in the description below.